Uh, like Adam said, we're going to be talking about geologic and geotechnical information uh, for risk assessments. Uh, but we're going to take this a little bit deeper. It's not just about the information. It's about how you use it, how you communicate it, and how you apply it to risk assessments. So you're going to be hearing things today that <clears throat> terms like depositional environments, natural variability in three dimensions, conceptual models, and uncertainty. All of these come into play for the geologists and geotechnical engineers to develop an accurate characterization of the site to inform risk assessments. So we've got a couple of learning uh, objectives. Um, so by the end of today, you need to uh, be able to understand the primary geolo geologic and geotechnical roles uh, to identify EFM. So basically, we're going to be telling you guys as geologists and geotechnical engineers what you should be doing during the risk assessments. You need to be able to identify uh, the relevant geotechnical and geological uh, data. We'll talk about that. And you need to describe um, <clears throat> the site conditions and the uncertainties that go along with that site characterization that influence the risk assessment. And then finally, and this is probably most important, is you need to effectively portray and communicate the information to a multidisciplinary team. And so going forward in this talk today, yeah, these are the things that, you know, we want you to take away at the end of the talk, but we'll be talking quite a bit about foundation conditions. One of the reasons is because over half of the dam failures in our case histories involve either defects or adverse conditions geologically in the foundations, or interactions between the embankment and the foundation that lead to um, high risk um, <clears throat> high risk scenarios. This is a guy named Charles Berkey. Uh, he's basically considered one of the uh, early forefathers of engineering geology. He did dams, he did tunnels, he did bridges, he worked on um, Shasta Dam, he worked on Bonneville Dam. So, he was one of the first um, guys in the early, late, late 1800s, early 1900s that really understood the importance of engineering geology and how you apply it to projects. <clears throat> and what he said is that, you know, basically there are many reasons for uh, failures of the structure. Most of them are geologic. And it sounds a little self-serving coming from a geologist, but Carl Trisaghi also said similar things. He stressed the importance of understanding minor geological defects and details to understand your site. So, um, talk really quickly about the risk assessment roles. Obviously, you have to identify and evaluate site, characteris site characteristics and geologic hazards. We talked quite a bit about this uh, at the site characterization workshop last week in Boston. That's DLS 109. You know, during today's talk, we're going to be touching on a lot of similar things that we talked about in the site characterization workshop. But in the site characterization workshop, you get that in excruciating detail for three days instead of just 45 minutes in excruciating pain with me. Um, so if you, I see a few people I saw last week. If you guys haven't taken DLS 109, I strongly encourage you to do so because we go through these concepts in, in much greater detail rather than just kind of taking a skim off the top. So the geologist has to be able to contribute to the static, the seismic, and the hydrologic loading estimates. You also have to be able to understand and portray and constrain your uncertainties and the site conditions and the loadings. And again, importantly, you have to be able to communicate to the multidisciplinary team and you have to participate in, at a bare minimum, participate in the project risk assessment. You can't sit there quiet. And finally, you have to be prepared. Um, when you go into a risk assessment, again, this is all about performing risk assessments and <clears throat> you need to be able to review the critical uh, preliminary information before you go into a failure mode assessment. And then again, before you go into a, say, for example, an SQRA. So come prepare, do some homework. So um, in terms of the roles, you know, largely the geologist has to play um, a pretty big role with the data. So 
you have to be able to compile, collect, analyze, synthesize. That's when it says understand. I mean, synthesize, integrate, you know, go through the data, make sure you understand it. You have to sort it, you have to organize it. And this can be a big lift sometimes, and sometimes it can be a minor lift. I've been on a project where I was doing a dam assessment in Southeast, and they gave me 2.6 gigabytes of data. So all the project files from design to um, construction, all the piezometer data that they had, all the CW models that they had, they just they just dumped it on me. And at first I was like, hey, this is great. And then I'm thinking, oh my God, I gotta sort all this stuff out. I gotta figure out what's junk, what's good you know, where the errors may be. So sometimes uh, you have a lot of data to work with, which is which is cool. Other times you don't have so much data. This is mostly, largely with levy risk assessments. You have long structures, miles long, with perhaps borings every thousand feet. Um, so the data can be sparse. Um, and even when it is scant, it's important for the geologist to be able to, to help the team fill in those blanks to be able to inform their failure modes and their risk assessment. So uh, this is a slide, this is just the, the typical data, right? So, you know, if I just wanted to show you what data you, you needed, you know, I just leave this slide up and we would have a five minute talk. <laughs> um, but we have to go further than that. But these are the information that you need. I've organized these by um, categories, right? So field and laboratory data. You know, you need to have all this field laboratory data, borings, gradations, material properties, strength data, grouting records, things like that. Maps and photos are pretty important. You have to have regional maps, geologic maps, design drawings. Aerial photos are very key. You need to compile all this information. And particularly when we have sites with very scant information, you need to do a lot of this background sort of materials. You can get aerial photos from the USGS, geologic maps, historical topographic maps, old soil maps, things like that. Sometimes you have to bring your own data if it's very scant to the table to help inform the failure modes and the risk assessments. And then the reports, you know, absolutely you got to go through these reports, particularly if you're working on something that has uh, had a previous PA or SQRA, you need to go through those. And then all the construction reports, if they have foundation completion reports, you need to look at those. Um, anything that has to do with performance history is critical to understanding uh, the conditions at the site and the risk assessment and, and, and your uh, failure modes. So next we're gonna go take a look at an example. Um, event tree. And we're going to walk through the places where the geologist can have input. <clears throat> so in this instance, uh, we have a uh, an event tree that's kind of a generic event tree. The first loading, usually you look at is seismic loading. Many, many places uh, in America, there's very few states that don't have any seismic hazards. There's a few, but some that don't. Um, so you look at your seismic loading, the geologist has input here at this part of the event tree. The geologists actually, believe it or not, can contribute to understanding the reservoir loading conditions. We'll talk about that in a, in a couple of slides. The third place that the geologist contributes is characterizing the foundation. So in this instance, we're, we're looking at a hy hypothetical liquefaction of the embankment, uh, liquefaction materials in the foundation of the embankment. And so you have seismic loading, reservoir loading. This is the key part where the geologist comes in to characterizing the materials to understand whether or not if we have seismic loading, do you have deformation that would hypothetically A, be greater than the freeboard, and then you get an overtopping sort of failure, or B, if you don't have overtopping from loss of freeboard, you might have seismically induced transverse cracks. And then you might have a failure mode related to uh, scour through the cracks. But we're going to talk about these uh, two, three, four uh, main parts of the event tree um, next. All right, so seismic loading. Um, the charts on the page are typical of what you would see in, say, an SQRA or a PA for characterizing seismic hazards. These come from the USGS probabilistic seismic hazard maps. And, and the geologist actually has a large part in what these end up, um, 
looking like because the geologist informs um, the source model, which is where do the earthquakes come from? How often and how big are they? And these source model parameters end up feeding into the ground motion calculations in the exceedance rates at a site. There are some places, not many, but there are some places where we actually have fault hazards with our dams. Um, these are some of the things that you would do to characterize the uh, probabilistic fault displacement hazard. Uh, but you know, the takeaway point that you guys need to know for the risk assessment is the geologist has to understand this curve in terms of how the um, how to pick off you know your your seismic loadings based on an AEP, but you also need to understand what goes into making that curve because you're going to have to describe it in chapter five of your SQRA. Right? You're going to have to talk about the seismotectonic conditions around the site, the earthquake activity around the site, you know all the all the things that feed into whether you might have a high seismic hazard or a low seismic at your hazard at your site, and you also need to understand these guys, the deaggregations. You know you. you we have a, the USGS has a tool you can go use to determine your deaggregations. But as a geologist, really have to understand what that means, whether it's um, the main contributing seismic hazard is from a fault source close to your site, or maybe it's just background seismicity. Um, so the geologic input um, and understanding is important to, to, to seismic loading um, at a site. So we can also make contributions to hydrologic loadings. Um, CORE's been doing uh, something that we call paleo floods for the last seven, eight years now. Um, it's becoming more and more um, common across some of our risk assessments. And so basically what it is, is you're trying to find geologic evidence that would reflect either long-term landscape stability and an absence of flooding within a given time period, or you might find geologic deposits such as silty sands, are shown up here that may reflect episodes or instances of flooding through time. So just a little um, flow, flow workflow, if you will. <laughs> you have to go out in the field to collect your geologic data to inform the paleo flood. So that's an example of finding silty sands in a test pit. We collect age data, data that we can take to the lab and they'll give us numbers about how old these flood deposits are, which helps put the events into frequency space. And that's shown down here, where you have a hydrologic loading curve, and you have, or for instance, maybe it's a non-exceedance down, an instance where you can say, we have not seen flooding in this period of time. And then that can get translated into your frequency curve at your site. So the diagram in the bottom right is just an illustration. It's just conceptual illustration, right? So it's meant to show that under, under instances we're using, say, gauge data only, you may produce a curve, frequency curve that looks like this on the left. And with the inclusion of the, the geologically based paleo flood data with frequency information from our age data, you know, it may potentially shift the curve to the right, meaning that floods become less frequent at times. So this is a way that the geologist can directly contribute to informing the hydrologic loading. All right, so the third part of that um, event tree was your, your site conditions, right? Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about site characterization. Um, and how it's important to the risk assessment, right? So the first thing is, is that um, you need to develop a geological or geotechnical conceptual model, right? So the conceptual model is a three-dimensional, it says depiction, I would say, it's a three-dimensional understanding of your site conditions. So it's the site variability. It's the physical attributes of the proper, and properties of the materials. And the conceptual model is what ties together your understanding of the site information in a relevant way that conforms to your performance history, it conforms to your geologic laws, superposition, cross-cutting, inset relationships, uh, variability. And it also has to um, conform to the site 
um, instrument instrumentation that you have. So the bottom line is that um, the conceptual model is a way to go from data to informing your PFMs and your risk assessment in a way that's internally consistent and makes sense with our geologic and geomorphologic principles. So um, characterizing the site involves looking at all these things, your foundations, your abutments, your geometric um, relationships between deposits, your depositional processes, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit here. Um, you have to understand things like your bedrock characteristics as well as your soil characteristics, uh, jointing and discontinuities. That's what the uh, slide on the right is showing. I did a risk assessment a couple of years ago and the district was solely focused, only focused on um, bedding as a discontinuity. And we went out to the site and, you know, lo and behold, there's all kinds of other joint planes that are relevant to the failure mode that we were looking at, which was uh, concrete monolith sliding on bedrock. And so during our site visit, me and the other geologists went crawling around uh, these outcrops that were right at the outlet works to collect data that actually had not been collected before in the entire time that project was going through a risk assessment. Uh, and then we were able to take that and translate that to the construction photographs of the excavation of the monoliths. And we could see those various jointings, there's three or four different joint orientations in the construction photographs, which meant that we could take that data from the outcrop and transport that to the foundation of the monoliths and we used that to show with the structural engineers that the failure mode had to break up and through all these rock interfaces. It wasn't just a straight sliding out um, bedding because these joints are all interrupting the bedding. So, you know, um, that's an example of how you would use your site characterization to inform your um, failure modes. In this case, that was a sliding instability um, example. So uh, uncertainty, you know, how do we characterize uncertainty? Um, basically it comes down to asking the question, what are the primary sources of uncertainty and how can geologic information address this? So down in the, the um, chart here is a, a standard normal distribution curve that shows you the one sigma, the two sigma distributions. Um, this is a way to statistically express your um, express your uncertainty data site. You know the hydrologist folks in the in the audience are uh, well versed with these kind of um, statistical um, uh, analyses. Uh, in geology, we can do this too. To be honest, you know there are ways that you can take, say, for instance, if you have a a, a suspect layer beneath a dam, say it's a low strength, high water content. Uh, plastic silt. Maybe you have 10 borings throughout across your entire site. You may want to look to see if you can determine, you know, means and standard deviations, assuming it's the normal distribution from which you can then calculate uh, probability distributions and um, density functions. So it's a way to, you can use geo, subsurface geotechnical information in a quantitative way to characterize your uncertainty. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you just, um, you have to do it in a relative sense, in a low, moderate, and high. And we'll talk about that in, in a couple of slides from now. Um, but what you always want to make sure you do is that you're synthesizing your information into these more or less likely tables. I think you guys should be getting some uh, exposure to that this week um, because it helps develop um, the relative uncertainty. So we're gonna hang out on this slide for a minute or two. Um, it says depositional environments control deposit characterization. You know, y'all at Site uh, Characterization Workshop last week got to hear me talk quite a bit about this in terms of geomorphology and that's and how that's relevant to levee risk assessments and understanding your foundation conditions and your levees. But the main point is there's basically no point on earth that you can go to that cannot be put into one or any of these sort of 
depositional environments, right? And so the um, typical depositional environments are shown on this page. We have things like fluvial environments, which is riverine and meandering, and point bars and meander scrolls, very dynamic uh, processes. There's also things like lake environments, which are not so dynamic in, in their processes, uh, but they have certain conditions, processes that, that govern their material textures and distributions of three dimensions. A glacial environment, we have a lot of this in New England. Glacial environments are much different than say a lake environment or say a fluvial environment. They have their own unique characteristics that come with them, whether it's till or eskers or moraines. So understanding, you know, the geologist needs to understand what the depositional processes not only at their site are now, but what they were in the geologic past that you might be inheriting in the subsurface. The reason that's important is because these process models help you anticipate whether you might have a high energy or a low energy environment, whether you might have well sorted material or poorly sorted material, whether you might have cobbles and boulders or whether you might have silt and clay. Um, so the geologist, is, it's, their role is to understand these depositional processes with respect to their site so that they can communicate that to their teammates and that can help inform uh, their failure mode evaluation. The one thing that I see as a reviewer, I review a lot of stuff. And you know, the thing that grinds my gears the most is when a geologist will say, we have sand over here and at the same elevation, we have clay over there. And they don't tell you why. You, know, you have to be able to say why, because when you can do that, you demonstrate you have an understanding of the site. And when you can demonstrate you have an understanding of the site, now the team believes you have a technically defensible interpretation. The depositional environments are also really important for your conceptual models. Helps tie everything together in time and in space that conforms with our geomorphologic and our geologic principles and our site data. All right, so uh, this is a nice little table. It kind of highlights some of the um, depositional environments that we were showing on that last um, on that last uh, slide. And it also kind of puts some ballpark um, properties to them in terms of whether it's a low energy environment or a high energy environment. Low energy environments tend to be uh, finer grained, higher energy environments tend to be uh, more coarser grained and more dynamic in their distribution of the materials. Um, and it also talks about the uh, variability that you might expect in the subsurface based on these environments. So for instance, um, an alluvial fan, uh, which has very dynamic processes based on how it operates by avulsion and flooding and creating distributary lobes across the, you know, that varies across the fan surface through time, creating three-dimensional subsurface variability in the horizontal directions, as well as the vertical, vertical directions. You know, are much different than, say, uh, a, a lacustrine environment, you know, this fancy word for lake, right, which is a low energy environment, sand, silt, and clay, low to moderate sort of um, grain size variability. And you, know, you might you have a uh, higher likelihood of continuity of those sediments in the subsurface uh, because it's a lake, right? They're flat and you're just putting, you know, fine grade material into a lake. There's not much in the processes of lakes where you might have um, things that cut through and erode and create more three-dimensional uh, variability. But the point is, is, you know, to have this process-based framework, because again, like I said before, you know, if you just say we have sand over here and at the same elevation we have clay and you don't tell me why, I kind of think you're just guessing. There's another slide that says, you know, we can use geologic processes to help uh, uh, understand the initial density of, of some of the deposits. Um, so for instance, you know, um, a glacial environment here, um, where you have a mile of ice on top of uh, your sediments and you create, you create this really highly compacted till that's basically, you know, hard as a rock versus something like um, uh, lust, which is windblown sand 
um, or alluvium that might have young sandy materials that are saturated and might be conducive to liquefaction. So again, it's the, it's, it's the relation of uh, the geologic processes to your conceptual model um, that helps you tie together your site data to make an informed characterization uh, for your risk assessment. Uh, so this is just a little example um, of basically if you were doing a, a dam or a levee foundation evaluation and you're worried about under seepage, uh, backward erosion and piping, you know, the question that you would ask is, are there erodible sand or silt strata that are continuous beneath that dam or that levee? And you have to understand depositional environments, stratigraphic models, you know, all the things that we're talking about, um, as well as your uncertainty. And, you would want to look at things like what is the spatial distribution of the materials with which uh, your embankment overlies, right? So you can do this by pulling out old topographic maps, pre-construction topographic maps. You can use that to inform what your what your likely spatial distribution of materials are, as well as your depositional environment. Are you straddling a big point bar that has loose sands associated with it? And again. Um, you want to tie this basically into a process-based model. That's a three-dimensional block diagram that's just illustrating um, some of the complexity and some of the variability that you can get just from a meandering system alone, where, you're, where you would put down flood deposits and the river meanders through time and it erodes out those um, sands and it might leave a clay plug behind or you might have a crevasse clay that comes out and just distributes you know, sand and silt material on top of the the floodplain. Um, but the key is that, you know, you want to use these kind of three-dimensional cartoons um, or process models to help relate um, what you might expect from the uh, dynamic processes or fluvial environments to whether or not you likely have continuity in the subsurface. So, um, determining geologic and geotechnical contributions. This is this is an, these are examples. These are examples, but these are hypothetical instances where you might ask questions that the geologist uh, would need to respond to. So, for instance, what are the estimated uh, piezometric gradients? So, you want to understand your instrumentation, you know, and you want to understand the construction history. You want to understand the performance at the site, and you need to understand that with respect to you know headwater and tailwater. You know, what are the dam and levee foundation conditions prior to and during construction? How were they treated? You know, uh, so what you want to do is you want to look at the information that was described because it makes a difference whether or not if there were defects in the foundation, if they've been repaired or not repaired um, during construction. And then, you know, how likely is slope instability? You know, that might be related to weathering of the rock. So you want to look at the the rock strength characteristics. You want to look at the rock descriptions, both from coring and from exposures. I'm putting Michaela to sleep. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, so those are places where the ge geologist and the geotechnical engineer uh, can directly contribute um, to the risk assessment. So now we're going to move off of sort of the theoretical part of the of the talk, and we're going to move into some examples. Um, from some projects that we've done. So uh, this is this is from Martis Creek Dam in, in Nevada, Nevada, California. Um, this is basically a phase one sort of example of a very generic cartoony cross section. And as you can see, if you take a close look, we're, we're, we're lacking a lot of data. So we have some stick logs on there. There's no engineering properties. There's no um, you know, percent fines, there's no SBT blow counts put on there. We have no piezometer information that might help us understand what the gradients are at the site. We barely have a characterization of the foundation as just kind of this gray zone of who knows what. And then we have something that's labeled as outwash that's colored in orange. But if you look closely, there's, there's coarser grain stuff at the bottom, there's finer grain up at the, at the top. So, you know, there's some subdivision that could, that could happen. But Essentially, you know, the bottom line is, is these types of, you know, bare bones cartoons are not sufficient, right? And have limited value because they're not really characterizing 
much of anything at all. And it's not even allowing one to uh, wrap their hands around the uncertainty um, at the site because there's so little information, it's just chock full of uncertainty. And as the Martis Creek project went on, uh, the team improved the characterization at the site by compiling, collecting, compiling um, all of the information that you see on the screen. So now we've got uh, boring logs with actual engineering properties and soil properties on there. Um, we've started to sketch in our shallow stratigraphy based on those borings that we see in order to help address continuity of the, sub, of the sands and the subsurface. There's pictures um, that were taken during the construction at the site that demonstrate what the materials in the foundation look like, right? And this is a challenging one because the materials in the foundation are essentially the alluvium that's got some volcanics mix, mixed in there. So it's very difficult to differentiate that from the uh, overlying alluvium. So characterizing, uh, having these pictures allows the team to relate what they're seeing in the subsurface borings to interpretations of the site conditions. We also have a bunch of piezometer data that's plotted down here. So we're looking at our performance uh, information. But the main thing is, is you got to put this all onto one page. You got to compile your information, the engineering, geologic, geotechnical, the groundwater information. Um, you have to put this all onto one page so you can see it and and these need to be on like big sheets, right? Like two foot by three foot sheets when you go into the risk assessment so you can hang it up on the wall. And when you're talking about your failure modes or evaluating your event tree, the entire team can look at it and can understand it. So uh, we're just gonna take a couple of zoom ins at the upstream toe and at the downstream toe. But again, it's, it's highlighting the fact that, you know, now we have actual, um, field data with engineering properties on it that we can look at to evaluate at a very granular scale, the potential continuity of these pipeable sands and the, and the foundation of the embankment. And again, same thing uh, for the upstream tow, um, again, relating what we see uh, in, the, in the construction photos to where basically the top of rock might be, as well as our you know, potentially pipeable layers on the subsurface um, on these diagrams. And um, <clears throat> as you go along with your conceptual model, right? So we talked about building a conceptual model that relates what we see at the site to the geologic and geomorphologic processes to help us understand why we're seeing what we're seeing. You know, what we what we see is from going from the cartoon cross section to this cross section, our knowledge has improved, and so we can update our conceptual model to accommodate this new information, in order to better inform the risk assessment. So it's got this kind of, you know, iterative approach where you want to keep, um, ref, you know, evaluating new data and refining your conceptual model of the site characterization as you go. So um, this is another example. Uh, uh, this one is about characterizing um, bedrock and fractures. Uh, this is a cross section from Abiquiu Dam in New Mexico. Uh, this really, really excellent illustration was developed by Amy Lafayette and Susie Hespatel and others working on the, the risk assessment for Abiquiu. But I wanna touch on a couple of really good points here. The first one is, is that they've got their bedrock assigned on the profile. So it's broken out by formation, paleo sandstone, and some of the underlying units. Those have fractures in them, and um, the fractures could be potentially controlling some of the water flow paths at the site. On the diagram, you can see they've got these blue arrows showing their conceptual depiction of how the water is flowing, which is based on the piezometers at the site. They've drawn in, um, the fill and they label it versus embankment fill one, embankment fill two. So they're they're putting the, the site characterization attributes directly onto the cross section. They've got uh, a plot of all their piezometers with respect to pool elevation through time. So this is really critical to understanding how the water is moving, what the gradients are doing as the reservoir goes up and down uh, through time. 
And also what they have, it's a little hard to see on, on the diagram, um, but they have, you know, very detailed uh, rock descriptions and data from the rock coring. So the engineering properties are associated um, with those logs. So like RQD, for instance, is a key one you'd want to put on there for understanding, you know, rocks and your rock and your fractures at the site. And the other thing you can do is after you've taken your rock samples out of the hole, you go down in the hole with what we call a televiewer. Uh, the televiewer is a, is a device that gives you quantitative measurements of the fractures and the discontinuities in the subsurface in a borehole. And what you can do is you can plot that up on a stereo net. That's this kind of diagram down here in the bottom right. Um, I don't think I see enough stereo nets um, in some of the things that are you think about reviewing, but you know, stereo nets are powerful because they tell you about the orientation of your fractures in three dimensions, right? So if you think about a couple of slides ago, I showed you the the there's the picture with the colors on it about the joints in the at the outlet works. You know, we put those those data, those strike and dip data into a program that calculates these stereo nets, which basically show you which way in space these things are oriented and how they intersect and how their geometries relate to each other. <clears throat> so this is, this is a really, really well done cross section. If you want a model of how to do it, this is a great one. So, <clears throat> you know, you don't, you don't have to be um, a wizard to integrate these data, right? You know, you should have the circle with the little red bar going through it over that guy. You don't have to be a wizard. <clears throat> It's just going through the effort and take the time to compile your information. If you haven't done it before, it can be a little bit like driving a car with square, square wheels. But you know what you want to do is look at look to your advisors, you know, look to your coworkers, folks who may be able to help you out. But you got to be able to put, take all this data and put it together in a way that makes sense that directly relates to your failure modes, right? I don't care if you've got a micaceous sand that it's micaceous unless. It has something to do with your inventory and your failure mode, right? So if it doesn't have anything to do with that, we don't really need to talk about it. All right, this is a cool one. So uh, talking about subsurface interpretation, um, this, is, this is a cool slide that kind of illustrates some of the potential pitfalls, right? So we've talked about levees and how levees commonly have very scant data, right? You may, not know exactly what's in the subsurface. But you might have one boring here. You might have another boring there. Boring A shows this distribution of materials in the subsurface. Boring B shows almost the same distribution of materials in the subsurface. And you might go along thinking, hey, you know, piece of cake, job's done, go into the bar. But actually, what we find out when we look at these in three-dimensionally in the subsurface, knowing this is a fluvial environment, that things are uh, very dynamic in terms of their depositional processes, you end up with inset relationships and cross-cutting relationships, things that provide subsurface variability, right? So this is, oops, this is essentially uh, an illustration from Santa Cruz River. And what we're seeing, because this is a fluvial environment in the subsurface, that these channels migrate through time. And if you just had those two borings, you would probably mischaracterize the site conditions because you're not uh, capturing the subsurface variability from your three-dimensional um, conceptual model. So. Uh, Limited site information generally leads to high uncertainties. And with high uncertainties, you have a high likelihood of misinterpreting the site conditions. And as an extension of that, you could mischaracterize your risk during a, for a particular failure mode. All right, one little side, um, you know, the conceptual model is, is not just a data dump, right? So um, it's, it's not just taking stuff and putting it into Google Earth and saying, well, that's my conceptual model. You know, it has to go deeper than that. But this slide is, is an example of, you know, it is important to put stuff 
into spatial um, programs like ArcGIS and Google Earth. And we have to layer things like our aerial photos and our LIDAR. So this is a, is a very simple example um, from a levee project I was doing in the St. Louis area, the Mississippi River is up here. Uh, this is our levee along here. And what I'm showing is just basically the locations of, of the voids, right? Where's your performance history? So you gotta start putting this stuff that's spatial in nature uh, together in, in layers so that you can understand why you're seeing what you're seeing. You know, we talked last week at the Site Characterization Workshop um, how these things that you see in the LIDAR, which are geomorphically called meander scrolls, are really adverse locations for backward erosion and piping. And so this slide is simply just taking LIDAR data that's available from the Illinois State Geologic Survey, turning that into a DEM, putting our levee alignment on there, and seeing, you can see already, some of these intricate um, geomorphological signals on the floodplain that are likely directly related to where we're having performance problems. So again, you want to put data, you know, the right data into spatial uh, programs to help you understand your site conditions and your failure modes. So, you know, like I said, uncertainty is often controlled by the data available. Sometimes you have a lot, sometimes you have a little. The key part is when you have very little data, you have to fill in those gaps with your with your conceptual model that's based on depositional environment and geomorphic processes. This is critical when I was doing a levee risk assessment with the Jacksonville cadre. We were working on levees in the San Joaquin area. Very, very little data. Had to really rely on what I just told you, conceptual models and depositional environments and geologic processes, but we also had to bring in a lot of our own data. So we had to bring in aerial photos to help us understand the near surface stratigraphy. We had to bring in historical topographic maps that were pointing to what the floodplain looked like prior to extensive urbanization is basically gone. You can't even see it anymore. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, the key thing is uh, with this slide, you know, is that the risk assessment process, the site characterization process is iterative, right? So you start with, um, you know, your new data, you bring it in, you compile it, you analyze it, synthesize it, you know, you have to, that's how you understand it. And you go around the wheel, right? So we go around the wheel. Um, so you're going through all the steps that we've talked about, right? So, you know, you're taking the relevant data that's that's critical to your, your failure modes and you're throwing the rest of that stuff out. And you go through the wheel um, one time and then maybe you get new data and you go through the wheel again. And like I say, you update your conceptual model, which may change how you portray the risk uh, for a failure mode. So um, the previous slide was an example of an event tree. Um, I kind of run it a little short on time, so I don't want to go through those details. But the key point is, is that the geologist has direct input to many nodes on uh, foundation related or internal erosion type uh, event trees. So you want to make sure that you're focusing your data and your analysis to those nodes. Otherwise, it's not helpful. and it, it, it can lead to an erroneous assessment of risk. So the key point on, on, on um, this slide here is that um, you have to compile your more and less likely fa factors um, for, for any node on the event tree. This helps us understand uh, why a certain probability may be more likely or less likely. Uh, put them on, all on your table here. And then you want to talk about uncertainties, right? So like I said earlier, you can quantify uncertainties through standard deviations. Sometimes you're just putting a relative qualitative uh, statement on there, whether it's high uncertainty, moderate or low. Um, and if there's high uncertainty, you are probably more likely to revise your estimate of risk based on new information, right? So if you go through, say, a risk assessment and you have a, a probability, uh, if you have a, um, 
APF that plots here, and you have a lot of uncertainty, and perhaps that APF is driving you to have intolerable risk. You know, you may recommend that you go into an issue evaluation so you can go out in the field and collect data that's targeted to addressing that particular part of the event tree, whether it's subsurface borings, whether it's, you know, geophysical data, whatever. Um, all these things in green are things you could potentially do in a field investigation. So if you have high uncertainty, you know, there's a good chance that additional data may shrink that down and improve the confidence in your risk estimate. Okay, so these are the roles, um, the geologist and geotechnical engineer roles. The first thing is you have to collect, you, know, you have to understand it through the conceptual model and through the geologic processes and your depositional environments. You have to be able to portray that on sections and drawings, and you have to be able to communicate that to your risk assessment team partners. You have to work with your team partners in a um, professional way. Um, doesn't mean you can't disagree, um, but you have to work with your coworkers to to be able to communicate to them. You know, sometimes they may not understand. They might not have taken this class. They may not understand what you're talking about subsurface variability because of the geologic process. So you have to be able to to work with your team members for them to um, understand that. You have to participate in the risk assessment. You can't be silent. Not helpful if you have data in your head or information in your head um, that nobody knows about. And then uh, finally, know your case histories. Uh, case histories are vitally important, particularly for geologists to understand how certain site conditions have contributed to dam failures. And the one that I recommend everybody takes a look at is St. Francis Dam. This is a classic, classic dam failure that directly involved the geology of the left abutment. 432 people died. It was the worst disaster in California since the 1906 earthquake. So um, take a look at your um, case histories because they help you become somebody like Charles Berkey, you know, a professional certified engineering geologist. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. Basically, the bottom line is geology matters. Geologists, engineering geologists, geotechnical engineers matter. All right, thank you guys.